Good afternoon, students. Uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the River Project uh, and specifically the materials and methods section. The materials and methods section is basically how you do an experiment or how you conduct it. Uh, doing is crude and inaccurate. Uh, conducting an experiment or conducting research is really how you state it in, well, anything outside of my Wisconsinite farm heritage. So uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that you do not uh, write this in a first person uh, aspect. You do not get into this epic uh, statement of, it was a cold day on the river. I was wearing my second best set of sneakers and uh, I was cold. No, not really. You talk about um, the parts of the experiment uh, without coloring it with um, your own adjectives and adverbs for a concise explanation for other researchers so they can possibly do the exact same experiment in the exact same area of the river at the exact same time of year and somewhat reproduce your experiment. This is very important later on um, in other areas, well, in any area of research, but in uh, especially other areas when you have um, some fantastic discovery in uh, a lab and it needs to be reproduced in another lab. Um, this makes sure there's transparency in research and make sure that nobody is, is actually having uh, inaccuracies or, or falsehoods going on. So uh, when you're describing this, you have to describe this in uh, a fairly good amount of detail. Now, uh, do you have to say that you used phosphate buffered saline um, of a certain molarity? Maybe not unless it's absolutely crucial for the experiment to work. You can just say buffered PBS to 7.6 or something like that. But in this case, uh, the major areas you're gonna have in materials methods, and I like to have it very organized. So you're gonna have subheadings of sampling area with a period behind it, um, usually in, in italics or or um, bold just to make sure that when you're scanning through this to look for the information you need, you can find it. So the sampling area, I really like maps. Maps are great. Um, already in the introduction, you should have some sort of map here, of course, um, uh, referenced uh, of the watershed. But what you can do is even get a um, Google map of the specific area you are sampling and then add an arrow uh, saying sampling area. Uh, you can even say this in the figure legend. Um, uh, where you can say arrow indicates uh, sampling area. You can even say when you sampled it. Uh, sampling area um, for the 1st of April 2020, uh, something like that. Uh, then you have to talk about the sampling technique, and usually this involves equipment, maybe not a list, but you can say that you uh, utilized um, or used, utilized means that um, you used in a piece of equipment in an odd way or a different way than intended, and used is really what we're saying. Um, we used a certain type of equipment for this sampling we used waders, we used D-nets, um, uh, things like that for macroinvertebrates, and I have a list. And then finally, you have to state how you collect, uh, what kind of data you collected and how you collected it. Um, if your fish, you identified the fish um, um, by um, training uh, through Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson usually comes through and helps you identify the fish or teaches you how to identify the fish. 
and then finally the analysis. And this is really the calculations on how you got to your, um, uh, used your data to get a result or determine what the result of the experiment was. Of course, for macroinvertebrates, that's going to be identifying these uh, creepy crawlies, as some people call them, in the river. Uh, we use the D-nets here and a dichotomous key. And we're looking for a, a number between 10 and 1, 1 being the best. And we get that through the family biotic index that I've talked about be before. What we have here is a really nice uh, dichotomous key or an explanation of one. And basically a dichotomous key, whether you're doing fish or um, um, are trying to identify fish, trees, anything, is a set of yes and no questions. In this one, it starts with, is there or are there jointed legs? Yes, there's six legs. No, there isn't. Or yes, in this case, there's three of them. Uh, or four of them, there's eight legs, there's 10 legs. Eight legs brings you to arachnida and therefore a water mite. 10 legs means you're in the isopoda uh, or amphipoda uh, area. Uh, and we don't really count crawfish. Um, but six legs, okay, yes. Um, we are down to here. Does it have piercing needle like mouth parts? That's somewhat disturbing, but yes. Okay, you're down to a certain family. No, okay, does it have a case? And it gives you an example here of cases, which means that it has this um, uh, form that has a little house in it. Uh, look, hello, poking out to say hello, um, or something glued together. So you have to be able to identify these things. And okay, there's Trichoptera, which is a, a really nice caddisfly uh, net weaver uh, kind of idea. Does it have wings or pads? It gives you a, a definition of this. So these dichotomous keys are very informative and it gets you to identifying this not only down to family, but you can bring it down to a, uh, a specific, not only um, order, but family here. Uh, and it tells you how to identify them. And usually we'll identify them down to this level. So this is a very nice example of a dichotomous key. And I have it linked on the middle of that slide. So uh, when you're uh, conducting this experiment for macroinvertebrates, you need waiters, of course. This person is very smart in having sun uh, protective equipment because you can get reflections and uh, burned very badly in the river uh, when you're doing this. They'll have a D-net. It is flat on bottom, so you can put it flat on the bottom and put it downstream from you and kind of um, grind into the dirt doing a uh, a twist motion, uh, or what people would call in the 50s, the twist. I was not alive in the 50s at all. It is a dance move. Look it up. Uh, then you would, uh, it isn't there to collect sediment or rocks, but it'll catch the uh, macroinvertebrates living in the soil. Uh, or the sediment there. And usually we sample in what's called a riffle. It's a area of disturbed water between one rock and another, and that's one riffle. That's a microenvironment in the river. So there are multiple microenvironments in, in a close proximity to each other, and this one will river, uh, measure this section of the river, not the section way down there, uh, because it can train, change drastically. So this is a small measurement of the river, not the overall measurement of the river. Uh, what we will do is, is dump out the contents of the uh, net onto the bucket lid. Sometimes you have to look on the net itself and then use forceps or tweezers to look for these macroinvertebrates as found here on the bucket lid. It's sometimes very small, uh, sometimes the size of uh, uh, much smaller than this eye in, in 
Okay, so once you find them, you're going to pick them up with forceps, delicate, delicate creatures they are, and drop them on isopropyl al alcohol, 70%. Um, and this is a jar you've already prepared ahead of time and labeled because other people may use your jar otherwise. Uh, and this will kill the creature, but it will also uh, preserve it so you can identify it at the lab. Now, for the fish uh, collection, you need waders. You need that shocking barge, so it has an electrical uh, generator that runs on gas, so you need gas. has electrical connections to a special shocking piece of shocking equipment on the inside with a regulator and these two extendable uh, shocking poles, so it has an extendable uh, tether of electrical gear. There is a um, cathode underneath a plate of metal uh, on the underneath of the barge, and they have these circular or oval shaped, actually these are diamond shaped um, anodes here, and they go in a zigzag pattern back and forth on the river, and the other person goes a zigzag here that overlaps. So they're uh, sampling the entire river uh, as a team. And usually we have somebody back here to help collect with them. But they're shocking the fish and the fish have this electrical current shock through uh, the cathode and the anode. And um, there are two switches that have to be um, depressed, one on each shocking arm and there's a safety mechanism where both of them have to de be depressed in order for the shocking to occur that makes sure there is no miscommunications and unfortunate incidents in the river um, so the fish are shocked they're collecting one here and they're putting it in the live well here which has water uh, usually freshly circulating water with the air pump in it and keeps them alive until there's uh, a good amount of fish. Then they turn off the barge. This can be not a quiet endeavor with the generator back there. Pull it off to the side and measure them. Uh, so they'll have somebody uh, recording all their data into different species of fish. They'll have what's called a fish tape. It's just a uh, plastic lined uh, rigid measuring tape and they will measure in millimeters. Um, Yes, you will need strong people for this sometimes because uh, this barge can weigh upwards of 500 pounds. So I am somewhat relieved this year as I would not have been able to help with this. More importantly than anything else, you need a DNR license for this. This is a specialized license. It's not a fishing license. It is a research uh, license for the Department of Natural Resources. Electrofishing is highly illegal uh, for sports fishing. This is only to shock the fish, to collect them, measure them, and return them to the river. Sometimes the fish are harmed. It's a very small percentage of the time, uh, but uh, we don't want to harm any fish if at all necessary. Sometimes with the larger fish, you have to hold them in the water um, upright until they uh, actually recover from the stun uh, with this uh, uh, collection method. So when you're measuring them, you're measuring in millimeters, you're measuring the type of fish that you have. This is an example of a uh, one fish that you might find in the river. Uh, this is a, um, a white sucker. Uh, and this sucker uh, is identified through a number of different uh, ways, and it's described on this really nice site called Sea Grant. Uh, this is out of the University of Wisconsin on how to identify the fins. It has this forked dorsal fin, or, or tail, I mean, uh, and it has this really fleshy mouth that... Um, um, doesn't really open the normal way and kind of sticks out as a sucker down there. These fish can be fairly large uh, and can um, be quite startling when they jump out of the river at you. Um, and so the white sucker is usually one of the larger fish you will have. And other, one other thing you have to look for and record in fish um, 
um, um, collection or data collection is something called delts. And a delt is a deformity, uh, an eroded uh, fin, a lesion, or a tumor. So lesions will be red and the, uh, the, the scales will be damaged. Uh, the eroded fin means it's not the normal shape. It's kind of broken and ripped. Uh, and deformity, uh, well, sometimes you'll have eyeballs out of place. You can have um, uh, overall damage to the fish. And all of these things are important to understand because that also helps us to understand the health of the individual animals in the river. Sometimes it's because of the flashiness of the river and the fish are constantly getting smashed up against rocks. Uh, more often of the time it involves uh, cancer causing or um, uh, heavy metal uh, precipitation that the fish are interacting with either eating from the bottom, which is this uh, white sucker, or uh, insects that may have accumulated toxins in it. So this fish ID is very uh, helpful. Usually Dr. Anderson, uh, who is an expert in fish, uh, the fisheries and a fish biologist will help us and teach us how to identify fish. Uh, but as of this year, uh, unfortunately he has retired. He is always willing to help out with the fish identification because he believes this is a very important, as I do, um, a research experience. Uh, so he'll usually teach you uh, the more difficult one of identifying a black nose dace and uh, not only a creek chub, that's, that's not too hard of a, a thing to do, but some of the other uh, fish species because these can be between 50 millimeters and 250 millimeters and we've found rainbow trout in there as well which get to two feet long. So when you're looking at the analysis uh, for the macroinvertebrates, you need to identify down to the um, family through the, um, the family biotic index, and then uh, be able to identify uh, through their methods, uh, through the Hilsenhoff method, there is a uh, one small table in the back that tells you the basic scoring for each family and its uh, materials and methods tells you exactly how to calculate this. So you'll have a number of macroinvertebrates in each family. You multiply that times uh, the, the number of them in that family times the uh, overall score and divide it uh, by the uh, whole amount to get the uh, index that you uh, collect together with the other families. And then you get an overall total number by uh, adding and um, then dividing by this. Uh, then you will get a single number, either 10, which is bad, or 1, which is good. For the fish, um, usually you uh, follow the IBI, and that has some very precise uh, uh, explanations on how to do this. Now, uh, some other information that you can use is water flow data from the USGS. Uh, this site is actually where we sample, and it has a real-time video of the uh, height of the water, which is very helpful for us so we know when not to go. Uh, and you'll find how fast it is discharging. And you can even set it for a certain time so you can go back in history and find out how fast it was discharging. And so you'll have these peaks and eddies of flow. Um, so you'll know when it was uh, very flashy or going from very low amounts to very high amounts very quickly. That's that flashiness. Uh, and that indicates also it helps indicate when you're going to have a hard time uh, collecting because the fish are going to be washed downstream. You can also look at the basic water chemistry and now the Milwaukee River Keepers have been uh, having volunteers do basic water uh, quality of the river and you can put that information in as well. Uh, they updated uh, 
monthly or weekly so you can get a basic idea of what kind of water quality you have. And they also explain why that's important. Uh, depending on the type of uh, time of year, especially now, you can have differences in the salinity of the water, which means that basically all the salt uh, that we put on the roads or the equivalent is washing off into the streams. And that uh, very much changes the health of the river, especially for the fish, and you can explain why. So this is some more data you can use to start explaining some of the results you found. Well, we couldn't find as many fish, uh, partially because there had been a peak less than uh, three, uh, four days earlier, and uh, we were having a hard time uh, or, and, and that uh, all, most of the fish were washed downstream and had not come back up. Uh, things like that. So I hope this helps on, on what you need to do for your uh, health of the river. And um, please take a look and uh, start putting that together for this week.